Welcome to the Inspired Evolution, and it is a yummy treat to be here today. We have with us Dr. Shri Kumar Rao. Doctor, how are we? We are absolutely on top of the world, Amrith. <laughs> well, I'm on the bottom of the world because I'm here in Australia. So. <laughs> 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 if you're that cheery and you're down under you're doing something right <laughs> well i'm having a chat to you so i think i am doing something right actually for those tuning in to dr shri kumar Rao for the first time bear with me just a moment as i do the honors he's a speaker author former business school professor and creator of creativity and personal mastery he's a ted speaker he's the author of are you ready to succeed great question. Unconventional strategies for achieving personal mastery in both business and life, which is an international bestseller. No surprises there. And also the author of Happiness at Work, Be Resilient, Be Motivated and Successful No Matter What. And that's also a bestseller on Inc's The Business Book Bestseller List. And also his last episode on the Inspired Evolution on harnessing ancient wisdom for modern business is one of the most downloaded podcasts on this channel. If you haven't checked it out, I highly recommend it. I learned so much in that episode. Doctor, it is such a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you so much for doing this with us. So I wanted to start, we could go so many different avenues. So like there is just, yeah, there is so much, there's a whole body of wealth of wisdom. Um, every time I come to these conversations, I'm sort of spoilt for choice. I feel like a kid in a candy store almost. I could ask you anything about life or business. Um, but one of the things I've been finding myself uh, surrounding more and more into the coming home to more and more in the conversation of is this idea of spiritual entrepreneurship. Um, I think there are, there are people that are what I see as being hardcore entrepreneurs. And when I say hardcore entrepreneurs, I've, I'm looking at like the Elon Musks of the world that are trying to see themselves go to Mars. And I see any venture of sending humanity to Mars as a massive risk. Whereas when you speak to Elon Musk, it's like, well, I'm just building a vertical trucking company. And it's like, what? <laughs> like that mindset is quite remarkable. Uh, where other people see risk, the hardcore entrepreneur sees opportunity. But then the conversation that's most um I'm most passionate about is this what I call a soft core entrepreneur. It's you want to create a life having an impact that you love. And it's not so much about risk and opportunity. Maybe it is, maybe the risk is not living the life that you enjoy. Um, but it's more about creating business for an, I don't want to say enjoyment, but fulfillment probably is, is what I want us to say. Um, I guess the question is premised around your thoughts on business as a personal development vehicle. I'm glad you asked me that, Amrit, because I've given a lot of thought to that. And a large percentage of my coaching clients are entrepreneurs. Mm. And I believe that running a business is the Swiss army knife of all development tools, literally. Mm. Because I believe that the only thing you ever do in life is you work on yourself. Mm. And a wonderful universe has given you all kinds of tools to help you work on yourself. If you're married, you pair your partner, your children, they're all tools. You try to be the best father or mother, you try to be the best spouse, but in the process of trying to be the best spouse or parent, you're really working on yourself. If you run a business, you want to achieve tremendous impact, you want sales to double, treble, quadruple, and quintuple after it's quadrupled. Mm. But in the process of trying to do all of that, what you're really doing is you're working on yourself. You want to have a huge impact on the world, on the world. you want to you know, affect thousands, millions of customers. But in the process of trying to do that, you're really working on yourself. Mm. So all of my coaching clients have that as an explicit, this is what I'm doing. I'm working on myself and my business merely happens to be the vehicle that has been provided for me so I can continue working on myself. So when you do that, wonderful things happen. And among other, one of the things that happen is you succeed beyond whatever you could have imagined that you would. Mm -hmm. It's paradoxical. You don't really care because it doesn't matter. It's not whether you win or lose, but it's, you know, did you progress? Did you grow? And uh, when you genuinely have that attitude, you find that, you know, it, it's as if you 
uncork some bottleneck mm -hmm. and the universe showers, uh, you know, success in you, literally. I love that because you share it with such grace. Like there was only two sentences dedicated to it but <laughs> in what you just shared, but I think it's a whole lifetime's worth of work in terms of perspective shift mm. in being focused on the journey rather than the outcome. Mm -hmm. um, I think it must be challenging um, for most people that, I guess, what are some of the challenges that you feel people have when they are so outcome focused and why, like, you know, I think most people in business go into business to try and make some money, to try and either have an impact, but coaching them into embracing the journey. What are some of the tips um, or what are some of the challenges on that journey? Yeah. The first step and basically it's an inward journey, Amrit. The first thing that I do with my clients is to get them to understand that they really don't have any control over anything. They think they have control, but in yeah. reality, they have zero control. Mm. This is something that doesn't sit well because most entrepreneurs are highly self-confident. <laughs> oh, hey, you know, what do you mean I don't have control? I can go out, I can make things happen and so on. And they've done that many times in their life and it's worked. And so they say, see, I have control. Uh, as someone once pointed out when I was mentioning this in a public talk is, yes, you have control until you find you don't have control. Mm -hmm. And one of the beauties of the pandemic is that it has really brought home to you at a very visceral level how little control you have. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, generally persons who accept it intellectually might say, oh, yeah, you know, I don't have control. Uh, my kid wants to get into Harvard, but his grades are not that good. I'm not sure if he's going to get in. I don't have control. My marriage is on the rocks. I don't know if it'll survive. I don't have control. Mm -hmm. But even when you say things like that, underneath that you're living in a, a, a world where things are predictable and under control. Mm -hmm. Like for example, if I run out of toilet paper, I'll go to a supermarket and pick up a roll. Or if I'm hungry and there's no food in the house, I'll go to a restaurant, order off the menu. Mm -hmm. And now even those things are not that certain. Mm. So you know, restaurants are locked in. Take, take my case. I'm a tennis fanatic. Mm -hmm. And I've been to the French Open multiple times. I've been to the Australian Open, go to the US Open every year. Last mm -hmm. year was the year I was supposed to go to Wimbledon and I bought tickets well in advance. And at that mm -hmm. time, if somebody had said, Sri Kumar, you're not going to go to Wimbledon, I'd have said, yeah, possible. Maybe somebody falls ill and I can't go or something like that. Mm. But it never would have occurred to me that I wouldn't go to Wimbledon because there would be no Wimbledon and mm. two, there would be no planes flying between uh, America and England. Mm. So the pandemic has really brought home to a lot of people at a very, very visceral level that you don't have control. Mm. And that's a very good thing to know because we have the illusion of control and the illusion of control is what makes us get up in the morning and make plans and execute on those plans. And it's wonderful. That's what's brought us to the level of success that we have. Mm -hmm. But if you use the illusion of control, knowing that it is the illusion of control and in your life at some point it will break down. It's not a question of will it break down? It's a question of when will it break down? Mm. Then when it breaks down, you don't go to pieces. You simply say, this is the time it broke down. Where do I go from here? But if you use the illusion of control, knowing it's the illusion of control, you never did have control. Why are you hitching your well-being, your happiness? Why are you surrendering your emotional domain to something that is not under your control? It's a stupid thing to do. Mm. Most of us make the mistake of thinking that the purpose of setting a goal and trying our level best to achieve the goal is achieving the goal. Mm wrong. The purpose of setting a goal and trying our level best to achieve that goal is the learning and growth that happened in us and to us as we try our level best to achieve the goal. If we actually achieve the goal, that's a bonus. Mm -hmm. Be immensely grateful. If you don't achieve the goal, the learning and growth have already happened, so you're ahead of the game. It's a no-lose proposition. Mm. The more you think about this and become comfortable with it, the more you will find that you're actually applying it. 
Mm. And then mm. you let go of the outcome. Yeah, this is what I want. I'm going to try my level best. But you know what? I am happy doing it. And if I get it, I'll be happy. If I don't get it, I'll be happy. It makes no difference at all mm. to my mm. well-being. I do it because that's my path in life. And when you have that as an attitude, two things happen. Number one, you really start enjoying the journey because the journey is the only thing you have. The destination, the outcome is a mirage. You get there, you tarry a short time, and then you're off someplace else. The journey is with you always. Mm. And paradoxically, when you really don't obsess about the destination, the probability that you'll get to the destination you want to go to increases. <laughs> That's just the way it is. <laughs> Yeah, that makes sense. I guess for those tuning in that are thinking about uh, uh, embarking on uh, the the venture of a yeah of an entrepreneurial venture and starting something up or creating a small side hustle or uh, you know something that they enjoy, um, how how does one then orient themselves? How do we do? You still set the goal, but you unpair your success from the definition of the goal? Or how would you- Unpair your emotional well-being from whether or not you achieve success. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It takes a very long time. It's much easier said than done, I can tell you. It takes a very long time before you can actually say, yes, I have done it. Mm -hmm. But when you do, the rewards are immeasurable, literally. Right. Nothing and, will ever get you down. And so if we continue to set goals, is there a, a despite wanting the outcome. So let's say you've, how do you iterate upon your goals if you're not obsessed with the achievement of those goals, if that makes sense? So if you're not focused on, you know, you set it like a target. You know, you've set a goal for yourself and having set a goal for yourself, you basically say, you know, if I am to reach this, this is what I have to do. Mm. These are the actions that I have to undertake. Mm -hmm. Put all of your emotional energy in to the actions, okay? And forget about the goal. Like mm -hmm. say, for example, take a common entrepreneurial one. I gotta get more customers. I gotta grow revenues. Mm -hmm. Don't focus on growing revenues. Simply say, okay, if I have to, I have to get my message out and I have to hone my message and make it as good a message as possible. I have to offer something of real service. Mm -hmm. Put all of that in and say, okay, you know, I'm going to consistently do this, you know, whatever mm -hmm. it is, marketing, advertising efforts in order to get my message out. And that's what I'm going to do. But I'm not going to obsess every day, of, you know, did I get more customers, you know, what is happening? I am going to look at it objectively and say, okay, you know, I tried this marketing effort, it does not seem to be giving me the yield I want, so I'm going to change it and try something else instead. That's fine. Mm -hmm. But obsessing over, am I getting it? You know, what is happening? Oh, today is a good day, today, tomorrow is a bad day. Don't go there. Okay. Just consistently do your actions and the result is going to take care of itself. Which is the grace of acknowledging even, I guess, in looking at your business as your personal development vehicle, I think even just that as a mindset is realizing that whether I succeed or whether I fail, that's borderline irrelevant, actually. It's just a matter of yeah. me being on this journey and the person that I'm learning to become and the learnings that I accumulate along the way. Exactly correct. Exactly correct. Mm. So so when, when setting out to choose a business, there is so much opportunity in this time and this day and age, especially with the internet right at our fingertips and we can register for a business here in Australia for a dollar. And it, I think it takes less than an hour to process all the paperwork and you can have something registered and turned around to you within 24 hours. Mm -hmm. um, what do we like the direction that people choose? How do we choose a business that's in alignment with what we were put here to do? Don't focus on what was I put here to do? What is my purpose? People are always, you know, talking about finding my purpose. Mm -hmm. A lot of the persons who register for my program want to find meaning in their life. What is my purpose? I want to find my purpose. Mm -hmm. A purpose isn't like a seashell or, uh, you know, a shiny rock. Uh, you're walking along the beach and you find it. You don't find your purpose. You create your purpose. You don't mm -hmm. find meaning in your life. You create the meaning in your life. It's not something that's lying around and you search for it desperately or you're taking a casual walk and you discover it. Okay. That's mm -hmm. the first thing they have to understand. Right. Wherever you are is the place to start because whatever you're doing 
do what you're doing, what is at hand. That's mm. step one. Step two, start thinking about what are the things that really cause you, your heart to sink. Ah. And does what that thing continue to make your heart sing after you've been observing it for a few weeks or a few months? Mm. Whatever makes my heart sing, is that something that I can convert into some fashion that it is a service to somebody? Mm -hmm. And the person I will be serving, will my heart sing when I interact with that person? Mm. Use those as the questions that you ask yourself and then you start, uh, uh, you know, really building the infrastructure for your business. What are you going to be providing? Whom you're going to be providing, and all the rest for that. Like, that. take my business. You know, I am an executive coach. I run my programs, and uh, whenever somebody says, "Oh, I'm very interested in yours," I have them read my syllabus. Do they resonate with it, or do they not? Mm. If they resonate with it, they're probably a good candidate either for personal coaching or for my program. If they don't resonate with it, I don't have anything to do with them. Because if I don't enjoy interacting with them, you know, at my stage of life, I've got too many other things to do. Why would I do that? Yeah, it's a great way of putting it. Thank you for that. So understand that what many would be entrepreneurs, oh, I, I, I got to get that person because even if I don't like him, you know, because uh, I need the revenues mm. and I can't afford to turn business away. Wrong when you hold firm and you say this is what i want it's as though you're sending out vibrations which get picked up and magnified and the exact persons who are right for you are going to find you mm. Mm. that's a really powerful concept and it works but you have to stick with it for a while before you see it working and there may be some lean times in between so a lot of entrepreneurs will say hey that's who i you know not for me you know i got to go out and scramble and get customers and mm -hmm. they fall back into the old race but it's very good to remember what ramakrishna said when the flower blooms the bee will find it mm -hmm. you don't have to go around finding the bees and saying hey i got nectar come come Your <laughs> Blue. And when you bloom, when your business blooms, when you really get that part of it right, you will find the customers. I'm not saying you don't have to do marketing and the other efforts, but you don't have to do it desperately. Mm. Mm. Yeah, there's an interesting, um, there's actually an interesting reflection that I've got on that is I've noticed in the past when there's been a yeah, like a like a need to sell something potentially in the business. When there's that neediness to really need to sell something, and maybe this is just my narrative around it and there's limiting beliefs in there, but I've never really been able to to sell anything. But yeah. when it comes to actually, I'm okay, you can take this or not, and it's up to you. It, I know it will help you, but, you know, at the end of the day, you are empowered to make your own decision. From that place everybody buys and it's like wait what like when i really needed sales like you said the lean times when you do get desperate and it doesn't you know it's almost like what i've had to realize is there's almost like an infrared energy that you're putting out in your desperation that's off putting to others <laughs> is that like a fair Absolutely. way of looking at it <laughs> needing something is a repelling force Amrit. Mm. when you need something when you want people to buy that's a repelling force people sense it and they go away mm. Mm, I love that. And so the ethos of service seems to be a central pillar in mm -hmm. your body of work. And I know you've taught some of the most premier business schools in the world, actually, not even just the country. Um, is this a fundamental tenant to A, enjoyment in fulfillment in life and also B, successful business? Absolutely. Big time. Yeah. In fact, in my coaching clients, I take them further. Mm. Most entrepreneurs and businessmen make serving the customer a transaction. Mm. Let me explain that how that happens. I have a customer and I want to serve the customer well. 
because if I serve the customer well, the customer will be happy, the customer will give me more business, the customer will refer his or her friends and relatives to me, and my business will grow. So I'm going to give good customer service. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful, and I applaud that. But that makes it a transaction. Mm -hmm. My approach is I'm going to give good customer service because that is my purpose in life. That's how I work on myself. I'm going to give good customer service because that will delight the customer and it will make the world a better place and it will enable me to continue working on myself. And if the customer is happy and gives me more business, fantastic. But if I know the customer is someone who's come from Australia and I'm never going to see that person again, mm. it's still okay because if I can make his life better, then mm the world has become a better place and whether or not I get more business is really not why I'm doing it. Mm. Then customer service does not become a transaction. It becomes the outward manifestation of the person you are. Mm. And that is far better. And that in the long run will also reap you much, much, much better awards. Mm. I love that. The purity of that, I think is, at its essence, what I'm hearing is it's all relationships. It's your desire to be of service to a greater cause, uh, to help people become the best that they're capable of. Mm. Uh, have you heard of my parable, uh, the uh, addiction to feed the dog, not the wolf? No. Okay, this is a very powerful story. It comes from the Native American tradition and mm -hmm. there are several versions of it, but I like the version that I created and I'm gonna share that with you. Mm -hmm. So there was a young man who was growing up to take his place among the adults of the tribe and the final rite of passage was a conversation with the medicine man. Mm -hmm. And the medicine man told him, here's this dog, kind, intelligent, loving, trustworthy. And here's this wolf, malvolent, vicious, ready to snap at and kill anything and the dog and the wolf are fighting. Mm. And the dog and the wolf are both inside you. Mm. So they ask, which one's gonna win? And the medicine man says, whichever one you feed. Now think about it, inside each one of us, there are altruistic, let's help each other and make the world a better place, it's impulses. Mm -hmm. And inside each one of us, there are, let me grab everything I can for myself and the devil take the hindmost impulses. Mm. And the two are always fighting. It's your job to selectively identify and feed the dog in you. <clears throat> it's also your job to selectively identify and feed the dog in every person you meet. Mm. And when the dog in you becomes friends with the dog and the other person, magic happens in both your lives. Far too often we feed the wolf and we don't even, we're not even aware that that's what we're doing. Right. Let me give you an example. You're having a bad day at work and you go to the coffee machine and uh, a colleague comes up and uh, he says, I'm having a bad day at work. And you go, you're having a bad day at work? Let me tell you about my bad day at work. And your bad day at work trumps his bad day at work and you go off feeling smug. You just fed the wolf both in yourself and in the other person. If instead you had gone, hey, you're having a bad day at work, I'm having a bad day at work, can we put our heads together and see if there's anything we can do to make sure that nobody has such a bad day at work again? Mm -hmm. And now you started feeding the dog. Mm -hmm. So in every conversation you have, every interaction you have with anyone, your boss, your colleagues, your partner, your children, with the Uber driver who takes you to the airport, just ask, am I feeding the dog or am I feeding the wolf? Am I saying things, behaving in a manner that leaves this person feeling better about his or her condition and the state of the world? Am I making the person more optimistic and feeling better? Or am I pushing him or her into a downward vortex? Am I feeding the dog or am I feeding the wolf? And if you do that consciously, you'll be surprised at how often you're feeding the wolf. And when you start changing it around to start helping people uh, move up, your life will be transformed. Because when you feed the dog in others, you automatically feed the dog in you. It's very simple, but so easy to remember. Am I feeding the dog or am I feeding the wolf? 
Mm. Mm. Powerful. And I love the, as you feed the dog, it's not just about feeding your dog, the dog in you will feed the dog in others. And that's the support of the journey for others as well. Mm. Beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that, sir. Oh, so you're very well. one of the things that that, it was one of the things I want to discuss with you today is businesses with a social impact. And it feels like the altruism that, you know, is available to us as we feed our dog and feed. Has it always been the case that actually businesses with social impact or positive altruistic intentions have always succeeded? Or is it just because it feels like right now there is a real breakthrough for such businesses? Yeah. The short answer is no. And the point is, if you start doing or if you start a business on social impact principles mm. with the expectation that this is my, my means for making it successful, I'll bet you fairly you know, heavy odds that it'll fail. Because this is something you do not because it's a mechanism for being uh, more successful, more profitable, having greater impact or any of that. You're doing it because this is really the outward manifestation of the kind of person you are. So that's when you find that the business rewards you. Some of the times it might reward you in material terms. Some of the times it'll just reward you in terms of your personal growth. But get out of the habit of saying, because I do this, therefore I will be successful or more successful or have greater income or earnings and so on. Don't, don't make a connection between the two, because if you do, then you get into what I call the if-then trap. And the if-then trap is a pernicious trap, which will suck all the joy out of your life. Which is, if I do something well, then I'll be happy? If this happens, then I will be happy. If my business gets to a million dollars in revenue. Uh, I, did I say million? I meant 10 million. Did I say 10 million? I actually meant 100 million. Did I say a hundred million? I meant a billion. Mm. You're mm. always on a treadmill. Mm. So honing in, so if if service is the way that we is the best place to set up a business from, um, and you know, being unattached to the outcomes of it, um, is there I guess do the question for me is Right now, I see more and more entrepreneurs setting up a business with that mentality, myself included, I guess. Um, and is that always been ever the, the case? Have, has everybody always been in service with that mentality of helping others? Uh, that's a difficult question for me to answer. And let me tell you why it's difficult, which is mm -hmm. the kind of people who reach out to me or who I associate with are all imbued in that way. Otherwise, I would Ethos. have met them to begin with. Right, right. But if you look at the vast majority of business, like I speak at the Inc. 500 conference and various uh, other similar uh, forums where there are large numbers of business, I would say that that is a rarity. People mm -hmm. are not primarily involved or uh, moving in that direction. But there are more and more people who are recognizing that that is the direction in which I want to go and I want my business to go. Yep. And I'm seeing a lot more people who are conscious about that. Fantastic. I think that's good news for, for everybody. Um, one of the questions I've got is, you interface with a lot of entrepreneurs as part of your work, as you mentioned. Um, are there some, and I know this is a gross generalization because everybody is a unique thumbprint and so everybody's offering is a unique as a thumbprint potentially, but are there some personality traits or certain temperament traits or mindset traits that you witness um, in consistently across the board that gives people, again, successes, you know, we're unpairing ourselves from that. But the, the tenacity almost to continue or, you know, what are some of the mindset pieces that you think are commendable for an entrepreneur to have on this journey? A wonderful mindset for the entrepreneur to have is one more step. And uh, let me tell you where that comes off. Yep. Uh, that actually, 
I picked that up or created that from a book and a movie called The Lone Survivor. Right. Uh, it the book talked about a American military operation called Operation Red Wing, where a SEAL team was dropped behind uh, enemy lines in Afghanistan. And uh, that mission went awry immediately. There were four people in the team. They were attacked by dozens of armed Taliban. Three of them died, were shot and died immediately. And the fourth was uh, badly wounded, had broken bones. And in that condition, he climbed down a steep mountain, swam for miles in an icy river, was found by friendly, friendly villagers who turned him back to the U.S. forces. So, of course, everybody asked him, how did you survive in mm. such conditions? And he attributed that to his SEAL training. And SEAL training culminates in something called Hell Week. And as the name implies, Hell Week is exactly that. So it's an entire week where you have very little, if any, sleep. Uh, you do things like swim for miles in the ocean and then roll around in the sand and rub for, run for miles with the sand rubbing you raw. You crawl under barbed wire with live fire overhead, stuff like that. Hmm. And uh, as Marcus Luttrell, who was a survivor, said, you know, when you're in hell week, if you ever think, oh, my God, there's five more days of this, you drop out. Those people hmm. don't survive. The only people who survive and move through hell week are the persons who say one more step. And that is a wonderful blueprint for life and entrepreneurial uh, endeavor as well. You will be beaten down. You will be, you know, made bloody. And when you are in the midst of all of that, if you think about, oh my God, it's so difficult. I want to do this. I have no comfort. I'm going to lose all my money. Uh, you're almost inevitably guaranteed to fail. But the people who dig in and they don't look at all of that, they say one more step other people are going to come out. So that, that's a beautiful mantra to have, if you will. One more step. I can see the power in that. Thank you so much for sharing that. It's gorgeous. And so with regards to um, where I think for those tuning in, they're probably getting quite inspired by the idea of the, the, the idea of a business as being a great way to grow themselves, grow their life. Um, is, in your opinion, uh, an entrepreneurial venture for everybody in some shape, form or manner? Or are there some people that aren't cut out for, for this sort of stuff? I wouldn't say some people are not cut out for it. It's just mm. that some people temperamentally might find that their growth comes from a different pattern. And that's fine. You know, some people want to be in a job where they don't have to think about, uh, oh, you know, how am I going to make payroll and you know, to take the uncertainty that is inevitably a part of being an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. Being an entrepreneur is neither a good thing or a bad thing. It just is. Mm -hmm. And you have to look at your proclivities and say, am I better suited for this or am I better suited for just being in a job, whatever it is. And, uh, you know, make your decision based on that. Neither one is the magic bullet, the solution to all of your problems. Mm -hmm. If you're in an employee situation, you have one set of issues you have to deal with. If you're an entrepreneur, there's a different set of issues you have to deal with. That's all. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, so one of the questions I've got, and this is a little bit closer to home, is for me personally, one of the biggest challenges I find in my own personal business, and this doesn't, you know, no reflection on anybody else, um, and maybe it is, um, because I'm speaking from experience, is it can be quite daunting hiring people in your business at a certain point and knowing not just, and it's not so much about how to make payroll, but it's more, am I hiring the right person at the right time in the right place? Um, who's my next hire is always a very you know, perplexing question in my world. And maybe that's something that I'm lacking guidance on. Um, do you find that that is meant to be a stressful question or a potentially uh, muddy question? Or is it meant to be clearer? And is there something that I should be, no, I should know about? I that? really think that you should not have any stress in your business at all. 
because I believe that you cannot make a mistake. Mm. This actually comes down from the benevolent universe model, which mm. was something articulated by Einstein. We revere Einstein because he was a, uh, you know, a great scientist, made uh, massive contributions to physics, but he was also a philosoph philosopher and he had a wonderful understanding of how the universe worked. And mm. Einstein said the most important question you'll ever ask yourself is, is the universe friendly? Mm. Now, the vast majority of us believe that the universe is neither friendly nor unfriendly. It's just indifferent. It doesn't know I exist and couldn't care less. So here I am going around doing my thing and there's the universe going around doing its thing. And sometimes it seems to be working for me. Sometimes it seems to be working against me. And uh, however, it's basically a random process and the uh, universe is indifferent to me. But what if the universe was aware of your existence and was friendly? It was well disposed towards you. Well, if the universe is well disposed towards me, why the hell does it give me stuff I don't want? You know, I want to go on vacation and it gives me the pandemic and quarantine. Why does the universe give me stuff that I don't want? Well, what if the universe gives you stuff that you don't want, but it's exactly what you needed for your learning and growth? It's like you're a small child and you want a tub of ice cream and your parents give you fruits and vegetables and you don't want fruits and vegetables. You want a tub of ice cream when your parents give you fruits and vegetables. And it isn't that you have a much greater, a different, higher level of understanding that you say, thank God my parents gave me fruits and vegetables. <laughs> what if the universe was like that? Mm. You want a tub of ice cream, but it gives you fruits and vegetables. So if you can adopt the universe, the model of a, bene of a friendly, benevolent universe, then nothing will ever get you down because you know that whatever comes your way is exactly what you needed for learning and growth. Mm. And the reason that's important is when you have to hire someone, we're in the process of saying, oh, you know, I made a mistake. Maybe you didn't make a mistake. You know, you have an employee, you hire an employee, it didn't work out. There was learning in it both for you and for the employee. Mm. And you look around that and say, next time I'm going to not do A, but I will do B, C, and D. And that's one step on your journey of growth. Who knows? You never really know. But if mm. you look at it as a benevolent universe model, then whenever you're in a hiring situation, you're going to do the level best you can. Here are the criteria that I'm going to have. And you work with that. And uh, if it turns out the, the employee is a great fit, fantastic. If it turns out it's not a great fit, you've learned something that you should do differently the next time. Mm. One thing I have found across the board is when you're hiring an employee, don't go too much by academic learning or paper qualifications, go more for do the values of that person align with my values and what the company stands for. Mm. If there is a values mismatch, don't make that higher. Right. But if there is a value smash, but there is a skill slack, not a problem. You can always train for skills. Mm. I love that. I love that. What I can feel shifting in me is, yeah, changing the narrative around the fear of, am I doing the right thing or the wrong thing? Rather in that benevolent awareness saying, actually, the universe is my greatest ally. So in that case, then surely, you know, whatever happens again, it'll be a learning and to learn to trust and not have so much fear around it. I love that. Thank you so much. You're so one of the things I continuously find is when I'm talking to you, I, it's not your, <laughs> you consistently leave me with this sense of optimism around uh, business and the future and the future for, you know, where most things are heading. Do you, is that again, just a choice in perceiving that the world uh, can be, you know, if we look at the thorns, we will have thorns. If we look at the, the scent the smell, the scent of the flower, we will be, there will be more scent. Um, Cause I, I do feel this ever rising optimism as a spiritual entrepreneur for spiritual entrepreneurism as a path forward. Um, do you feel that same optimism and where does your optimism come from for the world? 
My optimism comes from the fact that I believe that it is a friendly universe and things will work themselves out. They will not work themselves out in the way in which I would like them to work themselves out, mm. but it will always be perfect mm. because the universe is perfect. And I always remember that we never see the universe as it is. We always see the universe as we are. Mm. And that's something that I would urge everyone to remember very deeply. You never see the universe as it is. You never see the world as it is. You always see the world as you are. Mm. So and if you start sorting out the inner turmoil that is a part of your life, you'll find that it's a beautiful world outside. Mm -hmm. And the best way to shift our perception on the world to improve who we are um, I know you and I are both fans of books. Is it books and mentors and courses? And is that a wonderful, wonderful way of doing that? Yeah, beautiful. Awesome. If persons are interested, they can get a copy of my syllabus. If you, you know, link to my website. I'll put it in for sure. There. And in my syllabus, I have a section called life changing books. Mm. So what I would say is get the whole bunch of them, you know, it'll probably cost two or $300, but you have them lying around anytime you're down. If they're lying around, you pick up any book at random and read some, some place in there. Mm. And also you'll find something that will address the very situation that you need help on. Mm. Always surround yourself with uh, books, people, videotapes, audio tapes, in a material that takes you to a different level of consciousness. In uh, ancient India, there was a concept called the Sangha. Mm. Uh, when Buddha started teaching, and uh, his followers had three pillars. There was Buddham Sharanam Gachami, which is I take refuge in the Buddha, who's the person who articulated the great truths. Uh, Dhammam Sharanam Gachami, I take refuge in the Dhamma, which is the teachings of the Buddha. And I take refuge in the Sangam, Sangam Sharanam Gachami, the community of people on the path. Mm. So even when I was just conceiving my course, I always had the notion that it would not be a, I take it and I'm done, but it would spawn a community. And that's happened. We now have a global community of more than a thousand people on every continent, uh, uh, on all six continents. Mm. And the idea is that when you're part of a community, when you're down, somebody will lend you a shoulder. And when you're strong, you will lend somebody who needs it a shoulder. Mm -hmm. Always make it a point to consciously and deliberately surround yourself with people who are on a path of personal growth. Mm. And your job is to help them. And when you need help, it will come to you. Don't ever make it a transaction. I help Amrit, so when I need help, Amrit will help me. No, I help Amrit because I can help Amrit. Tomorrow I'm going to need help. It may or may not come from Amrit. It'll come from somebody I've never even uh, heard of in my life. Mm. Mm. Yeah, let me give you an example. So I was teaching in London Business School. And I had to come back to New York just for three days. And the reason I was coming back is my son was graduating and he was valedictorian. So mm -hmm. there was no way I was going to miss that. I bet. <laughs> but I was feeling quite queasy when I was on the uh, line at Heathrow. And there was a guy who was next to me and we started chatting. And I found out that he was actually an MBA from London Business School. He had just graduated. He knew all about my course because it was very famous. And he said, you know, I graduated before you started teaching your course, but I, you know, I heard so many good things. I really want to come back and take your course. And we started talking. I'd never met him before. And then what happened is that I had sharp pains as I entered the plate and, you know, he looked at that and he got his seat changed. So he was next to me and, you know, made sure that, you know, he took care of me. Do you want anything to drink? No, I don't want anything to drink, but, you know, I wasn't disturbed. And finally it got so bad. I went to the bathroom, locked itself, locked it and, you know, curled up in a fetal position on the floor of the toilet. And he stood outside and, you know, basically made sure I wasn't disturbed, which is terrible for the other people. They wanted to go, but there were enough toilets around. Mm. 
And then when we got off at JFK, he carried my luggage and took me through customs and you know all the rest of that. And then my parents had come to receive me. We went straight into the emergency room. And uh, it turned out, uh, you know, I, I was fine. I had kidney stones. And kidney stones, as you know, can be very painful. But the point is, you know, here was this person who came out of the blue. I had never seen him before. And I never... You know, we, we exchanged uh, names and addresses and we were going to keep in touch, but we never did. So I never saw him again. But help came to me from a, the universe really provided exactly the time that I needed it. Mm. Stuff happens like that. You be of help to people and when help is needed, it will. I'll give you one other example. This is almost eerie. So I had someone in my class who was from Egypt, and in my course, we have an exam, we have an exercise called the Other Centered Universe, where every day you go out and do something to help someone with absolutely no expectations of any kind. Mm -hmm. If you even say, oh, I did so much for this person, I didn't even, didn't even say thank you, you've just blown the spirit of the exercise. Mm -mm 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 -mm. So people get a lot of uh, out of that, but there was one person here, he was Egyptian and, you know, he was uh, uh, going to the supermarket, something coming back and he found an old lady and uh, she was having difficulty with her package and she had to cross a busy road. So he said, hey, can I help you? And he picked up her package and helped her cross the street. And then he walked her up to her apartment which just close by. And she said, thank you, my son. And, you know, he said, I felt so glad. And then he remembered, you know, my mother is in Cairo and she's living all alone. How nice it would be if somebody could help her. And that very evening, he spoke to his mother and she said, you won't believe what happened. You know, I had gone out shopping and I was feeling so weak. I couldn't walk anymore. And this wonderful young lad came up and, you know, picked up my bag and helped me across. <laughs> he said he could have knocked me down with a feather. <laughs> wow. 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 Oh. Wow, that's beautiful. Mm. Thank you so much for sharing that. Doctor, thank you so much for your time, your energy, My sharing your insights with us. I it have is... greatly enjoyed being with you. Oh. And uh, I wish you and every person on who listens to your podcast a terrific rest of your life. Oh, thank you so much. And I'm sure we'll be in touch with you soon. Thank you so much. Bye, Everett. Yeah. See you. Hey guys, if you enjoyed this video, give it a like, leave us a comment. And if you want to stay in tune for new episodes launching every Monday, hit subscribe and I'll see you in the next video. Stay inspired to evolve. Yeah,